following is a conversation with Professor Harry Flint, a world leader in gut microbiome science. Harry is Professor Emeritus at the Rowett Institute in Aberdeen and also the author of the book, Why Gut Microbes Matter. This is Inside Matters. My name is Dr. James McElroy. I hope you enjoy it. How did you get into the field of the microbiome? Okay, well, can I start at the beginning? I, I, yeah. Right back to the start. Excellent. Okay. <laughs> well, so I went to university uh, to study ecology at Edinburgh, for, and I did that for a year, and then I switched into genetics because I felt I was missing the sort of real molecular science. So, um, so that took me through my first degree, and uh, I then did a PhD in genetics in Edinburgh. And I then spent uh, six years uh, as a lecturer, first in the University of Nottingham, then in the University of the West Indies, um, before coming back to Edinburgh. The West Indies? Yeah, wow. Barbados. Wow, yeah. and you came back. I, well, <laughs> I had a permanent job, actually. But yes, yes, I, I felt that my research field was moving away. You know, all sorts of things were happening in the rest of the world. It was kind of difficult to... Yep to do it obviously so so i came back and i did a training fellowship an mrc supported training fellowship in edinburgh to learn molecular biology and these were early days this was 1982 and you know i'm very grateful to the people who helped me jane canard particularly helped me a lot um, to learn techniques of although i'd done genetics it was before the era of molecular biology so these the techniques were all brand new so I learned a huge amount in those three years, um, and then I needed a permanent job. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and I got so I got the job uh, at the Rowett Institute in uh, in Aberdeen, and uh, in 1985, and um, it it was a challenge because <laughs> although I'd used E. coli in, in my molecular biology training, all the bacteria that were in the rumen, which is what I was working on. So what's the rumen? The okay, so the rumen is is the huge organ of digestion in a ruminant animal, the sheep and cattle, and it's it's really a fermentation chamber. So, and it's only because of the microorganisms in there, the complex mix, that uh, r cattle and sheep are able to digest grass and uh, forage and, and plant material. Otherwise, they starve. Um, and uh, so, so the microbiology of that system is utterly fascinating. And uh, the, the, the ruminant gets about 70% of its energy, or possibly even more, from the fermentation of plant material. Wow. Yeah. So, and, it, and it's just the whole setup. It's a very complex organ. It has four chambers. I won't go into detail, but it's all set up so that you get this, what they call a pregastric fermentation. And then... There's an acidic chamber in which the the bugs who've done the d fermentation themselves get uh, broken down, and the protein is recovered from the bugs. So it gets wow. the energy from the plant material, <laughs> and then the the nitrogen supply from from the bu bugs that have done the digestion. Yeah. That's incredible. It is. It's a remarkable. So, so not only are the bugs extracting the energy from the grass, they're then getting consumed exactly. themselves uh, yeah. by yeah. other bugs. But well, by the, the lys there's a special lysosome, a cracking enzyme uh, that is produced by the animal. Oh, okay. Yeah, so yeah, and it's 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 a unique. Uh, well, not there are a few other cases of it, but most lysosomes operate at fairly neutral pH. But the one in the ruminant is designed to operate at acidic pH because it's precisely got to crack open these these microbial cells, and then the animal absorbs the the breakdown products. Incredible. So yeah. so back then, what was known about the rumen? Well, actually, the rumen was one of the best researched uh, cases of, 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 of animal gut um, microbe symbiosis, the other one being the termite. So it had been worked on from the 50s, 1950s, by particularly Robert Hungate, who's wrote, written a classic book on it. Um, now, now long deceased, I'm afraid, but... Uh, so it it was it was a model system, but of course the the justification for spending public money on that area of research right. was <laughs> becoming a bit thin because we had milk lakes and butter mountains and all the rest of it, and um, so and because the research was mainly aimed at animal nutrition. I mean, I was taken on 
as a, there were no geneticists at the Rowett at that moment. I was taken on to, to perform miracles. So somebody thought I was going to be able to uh, engineer an organism in the room and that would massively improve productivity. Oh. Uh, yeah, so it was quite a challenge. So I started off doing, you know, um, gene transfer work for the first time, you know, isolating plasmids and, and, and transforming them into rumen bacteria, which was a real challenge. But, but I realized that ultimately this wasn't going anywhere because, and in the end, of course, regulatory attitudes in Europe and Britain were not going to allow you to put an engineered bug in, even if you got the right yep. one. So, yep. so still I, a sticky, uh, sticky topic. Uh, still a it? very sticky topic. Yes. So, so I, I fairly quickly decided what I was really interested in was how do these rumen organisms, you know, what allows them to be so efficient at breaking down plant material? Right. That was my, my main interest. And I used my genetic molecular knowledge to and it was hard work in those days to <laughs> make gene libraries, you know, get the DNA, make a gene library, look for the relevant genes that broke down cellulose, xylem, all these important molecules, um, and and then sequence them. And of course, sequencing in those days was all about huge acrylamide gels and radioactive phosphorus and one thing or another. So none of this was easy work, but we managed it, and you know, we got into the field um, with a few other people in the world in the early 90s um, and actually what I, I what one of the things that that uh, I managed to crack was <laughs> the nature of the enzyme system um, that one of these bugs used was very similar to one that had been discovered in Clostridium uh, non non rumen bugs and it is a thing called a cellulosome and this is that all the enzymes involved in the breakdown of this plant uh, fiber are organized onto the cell surface in this one big complex. Right. And it's held together by little bits of glue called dockerins and cohesins. Co sorry. And the guy who discovered this in the early 80s was a guy called Ed Bayer, okay. uh, working in Israel. Now, when I published a short paper in 1997, suggesting that there was a cellular sum in this species, he immediately got onto me sent me a letter because there was no email and said you weren't first i was uh, no, no no well no no he <laughs> said by the way <laughs> would you be interested in collaboration oh okay and that collaboration lasted actually it's still going on in many ways but wow. it lasted for the next 20 years and was wow. hugely productive Amazing. so we showed the, the first case of a cellular serum in, in a gut organism um and it came to the point obviously a decade or so later, where we had the genome sequence of one of these organisms, we were able to show that there were something like 220 uh, proteins in, produced by the genome that contributed to these complexes. Wow. We don't know what they all do. Still to this day? Still to this day. I mean, I'm not working on it anymore, but yep. fascinating, we, really. We will get to the microbial dark matter later, which was, <laughs> <laughs> which was yeah. in your book. Um, uh, but just, sorry, sorry, I don't want to yeah, spend yeah. the whole time on this, but just to round off, because it's a nice story, is we, we much later, we found a similar organism, actually it was a French group isolated it, in the human gut, which is one of the few uh, human gut bacteria that can break down cellulose. It also has a cellulosome. It's so, called Ruminococcus champolensis because it was isolated in France. Wow, love that! <laughs> <laughs> love and, that. And, and the very and the very last point of interest in, on this story uh, is that I dis we we found another organism, a Ruminococcus, in humans, which is one of the dominant species in humans. That is the keystone species in breaking down resistant starch. Right. It makes a similar sort of complex, but it's devoted to starch breakdown. And we've called that the amylosome. And it, it, yeah. it, it, is your hypothesis that because we all evolved with bacteria on the planet before us, there are parallels between different species? Abs yes. Uh, well, across yes, across host species. So, and and the 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 final paper we published on this amylosome story, we looked at an Australian isolate from sheep, <laughs> right, of Ruminococcus bromii. It has an almost identical am amylosome to the four human isolates that we've looked Fascinating. at. Fascinating. It's extraordinary. So, yes, I think these bugs... And the other thing about that organism, since we're talking about it, is it makes spores. And it, it's, it's one of these gram-positive organisms used to be described as a non-sporing anaerobe. 
but, it, but, but it, no it's got the genes for spores and boy it makes spores so this is i think how they manage to be so prevalent and despite being very oxygen sensitive they can transmit from host to host and even, even between species i'm going to bring you back just a step because you mentioned termites yeah what's the story with termites <laughs> the termites have got a microbiome they do they do um and it it's Termites, unusually for animals, actually make cellulase that can break down cellulose, but they don't do it very well. And so they can only, so a termite will only be able to um, munch its way through woody material right. by virtue of its microbiome. Oh, man. And, oh, and, man, and so in, in one group of termites, um, and I always get this the wrong way around, so I won't even try, one <laughs> relies on <laughs> largely on proto protozoa, so microscopic animals. Really? Yes, single-celled animals. Um, in their body? Uh, Yes, in wow. the in their gut, and and the and another type relies on uh, uh, back, more on bacteria. It's so incredible. Um, yeah, the, the, and, and it was actually the first uh, thing that Hungate looked at was the termite as a model for symbiosis. Wow. Yeah. yeah. This model for symbiosis, how far does it extend around the planet? So, well, I mean, we talk about the symbi symbiosis generally is, yes. is absolutely fundamental. I mean, you can regard our ability to use oxygen for respiration as a product of symbiosis because th there was a very early, well acknowledged now, very early fusion between a, an archaeal cell and a bacterial cell that c was able to use oxygen for respiration. And those bacterial cells, um, reduced in size and genomes they lost genes all over the place but the thing they retained was the 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 electron transport system yep. and they are now our mitochondria so that is the most astonishing example of symbiosis for me and uh, the same was true for photosynthesis microbes had the ability to photosynthesize in the form of cyanobacteria long before any plant <laughs> Wow. A proper plant could do it. And it was only by the, the, the cyanobacteria becoming internalized in eukaryotic cells that you ended up with green plants. That's incredible. Yeah, it is. It's, it's, so is it fair to say that yeah. every living thing on the planet probably has some sort of symbiosis in some respects? I... Is that too big a grand statement? I mean, to be honest with you, the world is, I mean, the, the planet Earth is probably I, th I think yeah, I, I, I think it's incredibly prevalent, let's say that. I mean, yeah. you know, the, 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 the trees under the ground, the roots are associated with fungi, fungi, mycorrhizal fungi. You know, there are endless examples of, of, of symbiosis, and some very sophisticated. I mean, in my book, I won't try to explain it now, but uh, the, the light organ of the squid involves luminescent bacteria, uh, right. which... Are symbionts. <laughs> yeah, one of the. I mean, everyone listening should read your book, "Why Gut Microbes Matter." When, when I read it, it opened my eyes to the world beyond the human gut microbiome, which is where I've spent the last seven years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I did read about the term, right? But I wanted you to explain it because you would you, you would do it way yeah, better than me. Yeah, yeah. But my my take home was that actually this this concept of symbiosis extends to pretty much everything. Yeah. Um, and there's all sorts of incredibly fascinating examples in the wild um that are microscopic but also even bigger you yeah. know um uh, there's the uh crabs that sit in the shells uh, i forget what they're called again um there's also sharks who have little fish that yeah swim that's alongside right. with them yeah cleaning yeah. and they've got the the birds that mm -hmm. sit yeah. on the open mouth of the crocodile or alligator and clean the teeth, yes. you know? Yes. So there's, there's yes. all sorts yes. of incredible examples like that. Um, well, and, and pollin pollination in, in between insects and plants. Yes. I mean, you know, the, the I was just reading about this, as it, you know, the, the evolution of, of, of uh, uh, flowering plants in, in the Cretaceous went hand in hand with the diversification of the inf insects. And it's because the plants, uh, and it's, they were co-evolving and, and creating right. new niches for, for, for life. I love basically. it. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. So um, thank you for that. Back to the rumen. Mm. How diverse is the rumen? Is it, you know, in terms of its microbial composition? It's more diverse than the human gut. Uh, and... Uh, 
uh, largely because there are all three kingdoms of life represented in the microbes. So you've got the archaea, um, principally methanogens, yep. um, and th- th- they also exist in humans, but they're not high numbers in all humans. They're, they're increasingly important in rumen research because they're pumping out methane, which is not good for... <laughs> Of right. the planet, as right. we know. Um, they do sometimes in humans as well produce methane. They do, absolutely, they do. Um, yeah, but we have, um, it's not 50, roughly 50 50 methanogenic, non methanogenic people in the population. That makes sense. Yeah. Some people think that patients who've got IBS, constipation predominant, have too many methane producers in there. And that, that causes some of the symptomatology. That's interesting. There is a paper that, or maybe a few papers, that suggests that methane itself is a signal that's controlling oh. uh, gut motility. So that, that really is very, very interesting. I think I cite it in the book. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll find it in the references. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. So back to the rumen, sorry. And I'm yeah. keen to hear. Oh, how so, you went. so, so just to finish the diversity yes. story in the rumen, the, the, the bacteria are the most numerous. Uh, so they're a different domain of life from, from the archaea, although they look very similar. Um, the bacteria are the most numerous, and they're incredibly diverse. And then you've got eukaryotic microbes in there, both anaerobic fungi and anaerobic protozoa. And both those groups are very diverse. The fungi are extraordinary because they're almost the only fungi that are anaerobic in, on the planet. And they were originally, when they were first identified, they did, nobody thought they were fungi. They thought they were flagellated protozoa because the rule was fu- all fungi are aerobic. Well, not these ones. <laughs> are the fungi in our guts aerobic? Uh, yes. Yes. We don't have these particular anaerobic fungi that exist in the rumen. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Why are there anaerobic fungi in the rumen then? Have we figured that out? I think because the rumen is such a huge organism and, and the oxygen tensions are far lower than you get in, in the human gut. Uh, that makes sense. Yeah. So how did you go from rumen then to the, the human gut? What was that transition like? Okay, well, I, it, it, in the end it was quite painless and, and I kept the same themes going that I'd been interested in the rumen uh, in the end. But um, where, 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 how it happened was uh, towards the end of the 90s, we were getting a bit of encouragement to move in that direction, where I was, and uh, I got a studentship with Robert Gordon's university, ah. uh, Colin Henderson, uh, who was there then, um, to uh, look at the, uh, what produced butyrate in the human gut. That was his idea, to, to look at that. And... So the argument was, you know, there's plenty of literature that says that butyrate as, as a microbial product is really important for, the, for gut health. I mean, you'll know this, it, it helps to promote uh, apoptosis in colorectal cancer cells. In other words, it pr- helps to prevent cancer. It supplies energy to the colonic mucosa, uh, keeps it healthy. Um, but nobody could tell you what the major butyrate producers were. So I put together with Colin Stewart and... Uh, a small group, um, a project. Adela Barcinella was a student. We got her to start isolating bacteria using our rumen methods applied to the, right. human, the human fecal material. That makes sense. Yeah. And, um, and then we simply screened. We did, we did, a, we did a, over 300 isolates. I forget. It's not a large number, actually. But we then screened them all for what uh, acids they produced and found fished out the ones that, that, that made butyrate and then we used um, 16S ribosomal RNA sequencing to identify which w- what they were and of course what we discovered was a lot of them didn't, <laughs> didn't have a close relative um, in, in, in the culture collections and one particular group the Roseburia group were closely related to a, a mouse isolate called Roseburia sicula, but it, unfortunately that was extinct so it wasn't going to be a lot of use right. <laughs> <laughs> that not a help to us um, so so we wrote this paper we got the paper out in, in the year 2000 um, and it's still quite you know widely used and it certainly formed the basis for our work over the next 20 years on this group of organisms yep. and we're still we're still actually writing up um, Species description, really, <laughs> organisms from what, that from that piece of work. What was known back then? I mean, like if you you could stop a hundred people on the street today and say, you know, do you know what the microbiome is? And and I think a high proportion would go, oh yeah, yeah, no, it's important for your gut health. Mm-hmm. Back then, I mean, even seven years ago, when I got interested in this, 
people would look at you kind of funny. Yeah, yeah. Well, was it, it, like back then? it was it was a niche subject. I mean, there there was a quite there were people doing very serious microbiology on 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 the human gut. I mean, some huge numbers of isolates and some very big papers had been published, but it hadn't been linked with the molecular identification. So yeah. there are an awful lot of isolates that belong to species, and we, we'll never know really how they relate because the isolates have now been lost, and we'll never know how. Where, the, where have they gone? They, 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 there wasn't money to maintain the collections in America, particularly. So, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of these just went by the ways by the board and got lost. Yes. So well, there are papers describing things, but we don't Someone know. Someone needs to find them. I, I think you'll be lucky, but yeah. <laughs> but you're right. But imagine how many potentially therapeutically active strains, ah, yeah, were discovered then and now are ah, gone. No, I'm afraid that's the case. But you know, as as you know and we know, it's not actually not that difficult to isolate more. Yes. And I mean, what we found was, you know, doing, doing it was very difficult to get funded for that sort of work yes. in the year two thousand. Yes. And and two thousand five. So you could get funded to do to do sequencing, yes. but not to isolate things. So, so I mean, actually, we did one of the first um, because I I was trained as a geneticist. I I wanted to use direct amplification because that technique could come in of of gene sequences, ribosomal sequences, to describe the diversity of a community in the human gut. Right. And I specifically wanted to do it to prove that the butyrate producers that we'd isolated were abundant in the gut. Because everybody would say, oh, you know, you've isolated, you have cultural bias, they're probably not what's really important. So that's why we did uh, the what was the first... Um, uh, Direct amplification from human gut tissues, from human mucosa samples. Ah, rather support, than the stool. Rather than the stool. Published in 2002. Because when we did it, there weren't very many sequences, but there were enough, <laughs> enough, <laughs> I think, to show that um, indeed our butyrate producers that we'd isolated were really important in, and, in the human gut. And were they present in the samples you took from the tissue? Yes. I mean, oh. we, they, they weren't... They were surface, gut surface samples. They weren't yeah. deep tissue samples. Should, should we talk about um, the various different kind of levels, if you like, or aspects to the gut microbiome? Because you've mm. got the, the luminal microbiome, yeah. then you've got the mucosal surface, and then you've probably got another layer, and you've got the mucins and all that kind of stuff. So yeah. talk about what different aspects there are and how they might differ. Yeah, so, um, yeah, it, it, there's... The mucin is interesting because I think in healthy people in the colon, you have these two inner and outer mucin layers. So the, the inner layer is largely sterile. The, it's the outer layer that, where there's some admixture with bugs. And so mm. the interesting question is to what extent is that different from the luminal microbiota? Right. Um, I think there is some difference, but, well, there's... <laughs> A couple of things to buy. But so one one of the things we were interested in, and we we got a grant with um, George McFarlane, sadly now deceased, but a, a fantastic uh, microbiologist who, who was working at that time in Dundee, um, to look at um, the possibility of biofilms and um, also whether whether um, particle attached bacteria differed from luminal bacteria, mm -hmm. and the person we took on to that. To a studentship on that project was Alan Walker, who's now <laughs> much later rejoined. Who I was with last week. <laughs> re, well, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, much yeah. later rejoined our group as, as a member of staff, wow. but much later on. Um, but at that time, his job was to look at that uh, question. And and what we have a paper in environmental microbiology where we showed that indeed, uh, if you if you recover solid material, um, put it through a series of washes compare that microbiota with what's in the lumen, there are differences. And, and the key difference, the significant difference, was actually in the ruminococcus group, which I've already alluded to. They tend to be particle associated. Is that a keystone? I don't know why I'm making this. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I'm very pleased, I'm very, <laughs> very pleased you're mentioning that. Is so, that a keystone species? Ruminococcus bromii, yes. we believe. is keystone. And this, well, I might as well talk about it now. This, this, um, the evidence for that, or what made us think of that, was a, a study that Alan was involved in. Now, Alan, when he left us, joined the Sanger Institute in Cambridge, which was very fortunate from our point of view because it kept us connected. We weren't able to keep up with the sequencing 
craze that w was happening around the world. And right. because the Sanger Institute, if anywhere in Britain, had, had the resource, had the resource and the ability to do that. So Alan went straight in there and uh, was able to to join in with us in a number of projects. Um, what we were able to do at that point was to take advantage of the Institute, Rowd Institute's nutrition expertise, because that's what it did, to to um, uh, help analyze a number of uh, ongoing human studies. And so they what they were doing uniquely, and this was Alex Johnston, who's still very active yeah. in the Institute, yep. uh, was to run highly controlled nutritional studies uh, where all, the whole of a di person's dietary intake was was uh, controlled by our kitchens. Okay, yeah. and they weren't, you know. I understand. They weren't allowed to cheat. No, I understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the things were checked, you know. So they um, stayed over, didn't they? And, and they, they, they were. Well, they didn't necessarily live on site, but they had to report. If they didn't, they had to report to the. Because I've seen yeah. nowadays in yeah. the newer rabbit, if I call it that. They, yeah. they can live in yes. the rabbit. Yes, they could. They, they could to actually. make sure they're not yeah. sneaking off and having a. It depends on the study. An iron brew and exactly. Uh, it depends on the study whether they. Yeah, they, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but so so this this was very unusual. I mean, there's hardly any studies of this type done. So what we were in one of them, a particularly interesting one, we, what we were able to do, we brought them in for a brief brief maintenance phase where their diets were all made the same. And then we, we did a crossover trial in which some of them went on a high resistant starch intake, some on a, a high wheat bran, in other words, non-starch fiber intake. Why was it important to look at starch and non-starch? What's the importance of starch for the microbiome? Well, we... Okay, so <laughs> there's a medical reason, which is that starch, high starch intake had, had been linked with certain benefits. Uh, and the high, uh, high fiber intake uh, had been linked with certain other benefits. So the physiologists wanted to know, nutritionists, nutritionists wanted to know um, what difference that would make to the metabolome and to health uh, indicators. Got um, it. Very but it allowed us to ask a very interesting question about what difference does it make to the microbiome? Because at that time, there was a general assumption that an individual's microbiome was pretty much fixed. Okay, it will wobble up and down a bit. Okay. But, it, but, you know, it, and maybe even there were differences between people that had nothing to do with diet. This was the entrotype idea that was yep. around at the time. And is that entrotype idea dead now? Have we uh, just... You're going to come to it. You're going to come I'll, to it. I'll okay, come to. Okay, I'll okay. come to that. Okay, it's it's, pa it. it's partially dead, but not entirely. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll come to that. Okay. But 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 the, but the thing, the, the, the dietary trial, what that particular one showed us was that within a few days of switching the diet, you got dramatic increases, not in all species, in certain species, ones that specialized in the, in that substrate. Ruminococcus bromii was the biggest beneficiary from a resistant starch diet switch. And that changed just for the listeners because they're eating up yeah. what you're feeding it. You're providing them with 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 a substrate. That's what we call, you know, what they eat, <laughs> what the bugs eat. That you're providing them with dinner. With and dinner, they like with, it. Di with dinner, which they like. Exactly right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I think a lot of people don't realize that when they eat a plate of food, some of it is digestible using our physiology yes. and anatomy, yes. but. Yes. A lot of it sometimes, depending on what's on your plate, is not digestible. That's right. It needs to be gobbled up by the bugs. Yes. And you're talking about fiber and starch and yes. it's, it's these things that feed the yes. microbes. Yes. So, yes, that's, that's, that's right. And uh, I think for a long time, you know, we, fiber used to be called roughage, didn't it? I yes. know everybody sort of knew this. But, but, but what wasn't really known until... Really, George McFarlane and his his uh, collaborators in Cambridge at that time um, got onto it. Um, John Cummings was that there's a big fraction of the starch we eat that is not readily digestible, and I won't go into the reasons, but there are all sorts of reasons why that that is, um, particularly if you don't cook it properly. <laughs> right. Um, right. Yeah. Uh, so so that is a big source of energy for, for, for the bacteria in, in the large intestine, is the starch that doesn't get digested fully. And that we call that resistant starch. Yep. But it, the one thing in this particular study, which was really fortuitous, and it's almost anecdotal as well, is there were, we only had 14 subjects, right? But two of those subjects, when we measured what was, came out in the fecal material, 
they didn't ferment all of the starch. Oh. The other 12 did, almost completely. But, uh, so there were no traces left in their stool? That's right. No traces of starch, which you can do by chemical analysis. Whereas these two people, there was plenty of starch left. Huh. Those two people did not have ruminococcus bromi. Right. And that's why we, that's our evidence for it being a keystone species. Although we followed up with, with other, other evidence later. So, easy question for you. Yeah. What is a keystone species? Okay, so <laughs> I define a keystone species as one that if it's removed from the mix, from the community, it has knock-on effects uh, for the whole community. Okay. And as, as opposed to, if you like, redundant species, where you take one out and another one just fills its niche. That makes sense. Yeah. Why is the gut not just full of keystone species then? Why do redundant species exist at all? I think that's really an evolutionary question, isn't it? It's a population genetics question almost. I mean, you know, a, a successful group of organisms like the Rosburia or like the Bacteroides, you know, will diversify. Um, it, it, that's always happened in evolution. If there are tiny niche differences, then they'll, they'll you know, get in a few extra genes to, to do that job. Or, um, But I think... With, with, so I think it's the functions that are really quite difficult to perform. And the breakdown of particulate starch is a good example uh, that where you're more likely to get keystone species because only a very small fraction of the community has evolved in that direction. Right. And, of course, in so doing, they've lost the generalist ability to do everything else because that, you can't do everything all at once. You, know, you can't be a brilliant starch degrader and also use mucin and all the rest of it. So I think that's an evolutionary uh, phenomenon. How really. many keystone species might there be that we've identified? Oh, I think we've only scratched the surface now. I mean, I think you, will, you, would, look, you would look for similar species in mucin breakdown, for example, which is quite a tricky thing to do. And, they're not, and there's uh, Natalie Juge who in Norwich, who I've collaborated with, she, 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 she has identified some organisms there. Um, I think it doesn't have to be all about substrate breakdown either, because I think um, another right. another another group that I would regard as as keystones are um, lactate utilizers. So um, this is a, another area of particular interest for for my group. Um, Sylvia Duncan and Petra Lewis um, helped me a lot with this one. <laughs> we we the, the the thing about lactic acid is it's it's much more acidic it's got a lower pka than the other major fermentation acids acetate butyrate propionate and so we've known and this is something we knew from the rumen is that if you allow lactate to accumulate then the whole system crashes it, right and in fact it can be fatal to can the be fatal fatal to the animal yeah, yeah and, i heard i read recently that and i know really very little about the animal kingdom but if you feed rabbits the wrong type of grass they they don't survive or is that, and that something to do with lactate i don't know but when you say it can be fatal is that just because they've eaten the wrong thing and the microbes yeah, can't yeah, deal with yes it? the reason the one one of the reasons it can happen is 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 if you feed if you feed a ruminant animal too much readily digestible starch this must be this, what i was this, learning about yeah yes that's right then it, oh, it's because so what it is is a downward spiral what happens is you get there are certain bugs in the system streptococcus bovis is the classic one in the rumen that are very good at growing fast on starch readily degradable starch right not the non-degradable stuff not the not not the non-degradable stuff yeah um and they produce they happen to produce heaps of lactic acid so and by producing heaps of lactic acid, they drop the pH yep. to low fives and even into the fours. And of course, that that's not a pH where most of the normal anaerobes in the system can function. So they don't grow anymore. And you get dominance. Yeah, and um, and and unfortunately, the D form of lactic acid is actually a toxin. Okay. So that's what that's what kills the animal. That ultimately. makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a direct microbiome thing there. You know, it is, you it is, absolutely. It's, it it's, a, it's an instability triggered by uh, 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 feeding the wrong thing, as you say. Now, we, uh, in, in humans, there is an equivalent situation it's called short bowel syndrome, syndrome, which, I mean, it's not quite the same, but, but it, is, uh, it is, again, life-threatening and can be, can be dealt with by, by changing what you feed people. Very but, interesting. Um, mm -hmm. 
But um, so bringing you back, mm. we were speaking about essentially the Sanger, the sequencing, yeah. the culture collections got lost, and the evolution of your work at the Rowett as you were getting into sort of Keystone species and um, trying to understand essentially the makeup of the human microbiome and why each component is important. So how did that continue to evolve then over time? And we mentioned enterotypes. Okay. Should we touch, should we touch on it? <laughs> okay, yeah, let's it's, touch on that. So yeah. what, what was or is an enterotype? Because it was it had a lot of fanfare for a while, didn't it? Yes, it did. Yes, it did. Well, there, there was, you know, it came out of the, the sequence analysis done by the MetaHit project in Europe, which is a big EU-funded project led by Disco Ehrlich in France. Um, so they, they mashed the data that they'd accumulated from large numbers of human subjects from fecal samples. Um, and they, they looked at it and they decided it was not continuously distributed that you could identify three clusters of community of microbial microbial communities um, so i think at the time one was pre described as pre prevotella predominant yep. one was bacteroides predominant and the third one was described as ruminococcus predominant now this was slightly muddied by the fact that nobody really knew what should be a ruminococcus in those days. It was a catch-all genus, which has now been largely reclassified. But, but, that, that was, but also at the time, that it was before we'd published our paper on the dietary impact right. of, of starch and fiber. So, it, so there was this general feeling that um, you, you had a microbiome for life. And in fact, you know, somebody- That was the wisdom. Yeah, yeah, the received was that. And, and there was even a suggestion somebody unwisely made that, that these enterotypes were like blood groups. Wow. But they're clearly not. That fixed. <laughs> that fixed. <laughs> that fi yeah, I think the, the, the people fairly quickly backtracked from that. But, but so not long after that, though, the, some of the American groups got involved and didn't manage to find exactly the same. I mean, they did find some discontinuity. And the one that seems, but the, the th existence of three groups was definitely challenged. You know, is it more than three? Is it less than three? The one that stood up and still stands up, actually, is the Prevotellobacteroides one. Yep. Is that because of people who are vegetarian? Well, <laughs> I don't think it's that simple. We, we, you know, I was quite mystified and skeptical about this for a long time because we'd never found many Prevotellas. But... In, in our latest study that was published a couple of years ago in BMC Microbiology, we, we looked at um, doing a, a dietary intervention with 21 subjects locally here. Um, and to our surprise, we found eight of the subjects were Prevotella predominant, you know, anything up to a quarter of their microbiota were Prevotella. The remaining 13 had almost no Prevotella, wow. and we're bacteroides predominant. And for, for the listener, what's special or interesting about Prevotella? We know very little about it <laughs> in the human. It's it's really dominant organism in, in, in the rumen, um, but it, it, it's it's uh, those two genera are both in the in this big ground-negative phylum of Bacteroidaceae, so, or Bacteroidetes, I should say. So... Um, Superficially, they're rather similar organisms. You know, they have a, a characteristic gram-negative uh, cell wall. Um, they produce pr largely propionic acid as a product um, and some succinate as well. But um, and they appear to they have a lot of genes concerned with the breakdown of polysaccharides, carbohydrates, uh, fiber. So you would think it didn't make it would make much difference. But actually, there's something, and we still don't know what it is, that means that they don't like to coexist in the same host. Interesting. And and they, you know, I could I could come up with half a dozen possible reasons for that. Maybe we don't have time for that. But, um, it, but it seemed it's it's stood up through multiple human trials, and and now that we we found it in our own trial, I actually believe it. You know, it's because <laughs> so so that's what you meant by it's kind of dead, but it's not really. Dead. But it's not really dead. No, there is definitely there is definitely a mutual exclusion or something that that means that you don't get a lot of Bacteroides and a lot of Prevotella and at the same could, time. Could it be explained by? And now we're getting into the six things or so that you probably 
thought we wouldn't have time for. But could it, <laughs> could, could it be that, for example, the mother of the person who's pervitella predominant was also pervitella predominant and a vegetarian, and therefore what was seeded at birth was a little bit of pervitella? Is that one theory? It's one theory. It's one theory, definitely. Yes, yes. That so there is a correlation with fiber intake, uh, right? In some studies, and and the classic one, actually, I think um, an Italian study, but there's also an American study that shows the same thing. Is there was a group of African children with much higher fiber intake compared to a group of Italian children. The African children had a lot of Prevotella. The Italian children, the Italians didn't. were having the Italian food. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Lots of pasta yeah. and yeah. Um, and a similar by Gary Wu in the states. Came Came up with a similar, a, thing. a similar thing in 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 American populations. In our study, so we thought that was the answer too. Um, but when we we actually looked at the primer intake of our of our subjects, and there was a definite overlap, complete overlap between the bacteroides predominant and the Prevotella predominant. Interesting. Group. So it didn't seem as it, to us it's as, as it was clear, going to be as simple as that. It's not as clear cut. As but that. what we did find in that was that we did a, a, an intervention with with a thing called Axos, which is a prebiotic derived from fiber, so as uh, xylooligosaccharides basically, and um, that was added as a supplement in this study. And what we did find was that Provotella was greatly encouraged by. Mm. By the axles, and is that a good thing? It we do, well, that's the jury's out on that. Because so should everybody it, have a fiber supplement if they're not getting enough uh, from their diet? With that, you're taking me in a different direction now. <laughs> but it, it, dep- it, dep- it depends where they sit on the recommended intake scale. So oh, they, they they should try to achieve the recommended in- intake. Whether they do it with a particular prebiotic, most people, well, many people would say that. A, a complex fiber yep. is better, you know, gen- in general terms than a specific supplement. Can we go down this rabbit hole a little bit? Yeah, yeah. Let's do it. So, so um, African Amazonian tribes. Yes, there's been a bit of research to suggest that they have like a seven to eighty, a hundred grams of fiber a day, which yes. is far more than the recommended twenty or thirty. Yes, from, and it's been observed that they don't have autoimmune disease. And one of the links that's been made is, well, because their fiber intake is so high, but they also probably don't have antibiotics. Should we all just be trying to increase our fiber intake as much as possible because it benefits our microbiome? I think we should be trying to achieve an intake that is, A, comfortable for us. <laughs> because if, if, if you don't want to go, be going to the toilet three times a day, then, you know. Well, some, some uh, people, uh, we, we know, because we yeah, run a program yeah, yeah. called Number Two. Yeah, some yeah. people go three times a day. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, so I think most people don't eat enough fiber. That's true yeah. in in this country and in this in in much of Europe and the states. So yes, there is a case for increasing it. Whether you want to continue to increase it to the sort of levels you find in in, in Africa, is 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 is, I think an individual choice. Um, but it's not just based on comfort. It's also based on the fact that for some people with gut disorders, um, are fiber sensitive. So. Uh, the, That's you know, fascinating. Irritable bowel syndrome, for example, will be made worse, some forms of it, by too much fiber. And um, in fact, there's 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 a special diet that seems to resolve that condition, yep. which is specifically lacking in fiber yeah. sources. So, so it's sort of dampening them down. Yeah. Also, Crohn's disease, the exclusively liquid diet. That's, that, that's right. That's right. Yes. So so you, it, so it, you, ca- you can't tell everybody that this is what they should be doing actually and and so that's just another point i, I know I keep, i've said too much probably about this little um human study but one of the things we did find was that the response to the prebiotic was dependent on whether you were prevotella plus minus so you your bifida bacteria were much higher in the prevotella minus group um and they were the main beneficiaries of the of the prebiotic in that group whereas the prevotella were the main beneficiaries in the other group so I think we start. We don't. We probably don't want to insist on a generalized recommendation for everybody because it does depend. Uh, Makes on sense. Personal circumstances. I mean, so. I get asked all the time, "What should I do for my microbiome?" Mm-hmm. You probably get asked that all the time as well. Yeah. <laughs> what do you say? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I, I think actually adequate fiber is one it's of a them. Good one. Is yeah. is one of them because in terms of maintaining diversity, which uh, we we can discuss, but it. It, it, it's certainly the best way to do that. And uh, there was a quite an extreme American study, um, which I'm sure you've come across, where uh, 
a group of subjects were put a very short term study put on on a plant based purely plant based and what they regarded as a purely animal based diet and they were very extreme forms but the animal based diet was uh pretty nasty in its consequences you know you yep. got you got sulfur reducing bacteria you got potential pathogens all sorts of things coming up yep uh the plant the, the animal uh, sorry the plant based diet was was promoting much more favorable uh, i mean i have not groups. met a single person yet who's gone plant based Increase the fiber intake, eat more fruit and vegetables, cut their meat down, and not felt better. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I haven't met anyone yet. Yeah, Everyone yeah, feels better. Yeah, yeah. But that that goes at odds, I guess, with something that you had in your book, and I can't remember the specifics, but you were you gave a ratio or a percentage of sort of how much of your digestive tract mm. was um, designed or geared up to digest plants. And humans were right at the kind of bottom, weren't yeah. they? At the top, you had that's your right. horses Along and your the cows. Yeah. Cows. At that's the top. right. Yeah. That's right. Uh, cats and dogs. Uh, yeah, we we were with the cats and dogs. With the cats and the dogs, and that yeah. suggests that we're more carnivorous than omnivorous, as in we eat more meat. But uh -huh. so, how does that work when everyone that we know looks better, feels better when they eat a really fiber-rich plant diet? Yet most of our GI tract is geared up to digest you know, the meats, the proteins, and the simple sugars? Well, I guess, and you know, the, the answer to this must lie in our early evolution in the sort of five million years of uh, ice ages and what there was to eat, because, uh, I, you know, I think almost of necessity, um, probably the humans did have a fairly uh, meat-based meat, meat -based or fish-based diet at that time, because they would desperately looking around for well, our numbers were very low we were marauding bands you know with our axes and spears and going from place to place just trying to find something to eat yeah and uh you know uh, so yes there would have been consumption of roots and berries and so forth but uh, probably meat was was extremely important and that may explain uh right. that that digestive anatomy but an interesting point i think is that Probably at that time, um, the energy that you extracted indirectly through your microbiota was probably critical to survival as well. So, well, you know, if you've got some grass seed, if you've got some not terribly digestible tuber out of the ground, and uh, then you probably didn't get much direct energy out of that. But the fermentation that went on in the colon... So would have supplied critical additional calories so uh yeah that I makes think, a lot of sense yeah yeah so why why do we think the microbes are there altogether is it for that reason they they or is it because they were on the planet before us oh way because they were on the planet before us and we don't have any mechanism for excluding them i mean if you know maybe maybe born in a bubble <laughs> well well that's the thing i mean i say that in the book as well is is you know uh, there's some suggestion uh, in certain experiments that you know germ-free mice are less prone to to get fat um there's also papers that say the opposite but yes. um but you know the fact is we don't have the choice to be germ-free <laughs> In, no, in our gut, we we can't. You'd you know, be sat in a bubble for the rest of your life. Well, yeah. it, it, you you do it with mice. You have to feed them sterile food. You have to yeah. keep them in an isolator, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's just not an option for us. And uh, you know, this is another interesting sidelight. Is yes, I mean, in a way, the digestive tract is external to us, isn't it? I mean, we we have an acidic barrier in the stomach, which kills a lot of the stuff that comes through the mouth. But otherwise, we we're exposed to anything that's in the environment everywhere and, yeah everywhere. and they are really everywhere aren't they they are everywhere literally everywhere they are everywhere and uh, so what's and despite that it's in, what's very interesting that you get host specific species yeah. in you know a, a lot of our species in our gut are only exist in humans yeah that that's something i want to talk about what, yeah. how, how is that even possible when there there's microbes absolutely everywhere else and we seem to just be colonized by what we call human microbes and dogs are dogs microbes and horses are horse microbes. And yeah. do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So how is well, that a thing? I, 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 I is think it the immune it's, system? It, 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 it's, mm, I hadn't assumed it was the immune, but uh, it's, it's, it, that may be part of it, yes. But um, yeah, I, I mean, it, it's uh, evolution, isn't it? I mean, it, it's, uh, it, 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 
the environment of the rumen is somewhat similar to the colon in the human, but it's not identical. And so, you know, the, the species will, uh, and the food supply coming in is very different because it's coming in directly. What, what goes in the animal's mouth goes into the rumen, whereas in our case, yeah. you know, it, it's you get extraction. Stomach first. You get stomach first, digestion, absorption, etc. cetera. So it, it's a very, it, inevitably, the characteristics you need to be successful in the two the two systems are different, and that will lead to speciation. If, in addition, uh, and this is the interesting thing actually to me, um, there is limited transmission between the environment and the gut. So, so most of the transmission is from parent to offspring, mother to offspring. Yep. Um, during those early years. During those early years, exactly. So. So that so, but of course, it's not true with facultative anaerobes. So E. coli, you know, there's plenty of work showing that a farm worker will pick up E. coli from the farm animals, yeah. the dogs, and etc. Yeah. Um, because those those organisms can can transmit in droplets and yep. exist. And to some extent, we mentioned spores earlier. I mean, the same is true for some. We don't know how many of the anaerobes are spore formers, but among the gram positives, it's probably quite a lot, lot more than we think. So there is the ability to transmit between hosts. So I think it's got more to do with adaptation to the particular environment. Um, it's it is remarkable in humans because we're not that old a species that um, right. you know that we've uh, differentiated in relatively s small number of, uh, of millions of years. But right. uh, and there's also huge diversity between. So so there's parallels between my microbiome and your microbiome. But mine is as unique to me as well my fingerprint, yeah. right? Yeah, I, I mean this uh, this comes down to the issue of core species, which was a you know not a bone of contention. There was a debate at one time: is 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 can you define a group of core species that will be found in almost every human? Um, to which the answer is yes, pretty much. Um, but but their proportions will vary between individuals. When we say species, do we really mean species or do we mean some higher level of taxonomic classification? Well, I, there, I'm talking about species there because I think it applies to species, but um, but it doesn't apply to strains <laughs> because right. where the uniqueness applies, I think, is at the strain level. And Interesting. The, 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 again, it comes down to adaptation to a particular environment everybody's gut is subtly different different ph's different transit times different immune system different set of immune genes yep. um, so there's plenty of scope and in, it's inevitable that um strains on genetic grounds that, that stra strain variants will appear and will be yeah. yeah huge variants right yeah exactly so we're on to keystone species and diversity mm -hmm. So how, how how can we describe the microbiomes then across different people? Like what are the metrics or parameters that are important? So so well, this this is uh, my sort of cue to, to 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 talk about the way we decided to start to analyze the system. So we've we've mentioned that uh, for some functions and butyrate production would be one of them. There's a lot of redundancy. You know, there may be dozens of, of species, uh, hundreds of strains that can produce butyrate. Does it actually matter that much which one is predominant in which person? Uh, I mean, I think th th there are enough differences to suggest that it may matter, actually. But um, at the species level, genus level, not so much at the strain level. So, but what we decided when we were, to when we were thinking about trying to model the system theoretically we decided the way to cope with this was to define a functional group. So you could have one functional group for butyrate producers. We actually decided to make three. For so butyrate? We, for butyrate, yeah, because we oh. think it's such an important... We, well, we love butyrate. We love, well, we love, we think it's important. <laughs> we think, and we, and we had a lot of, basically we had a lot of information on butyrate producing bacteria that we didn't have for some of the other uh, at once. So, so we had one that corresponded to Fecalibacterium, we had one that corresponded to uh, Roseburia erectale, and we had another one that corresponded to the lactate utilizers that can make butyrate, which seemed to be a quite distinct uh, functional group. So um, we, dis we had a total of 10 functional groups, so we also had acetogens, we had methanogens, we had propionate producers, etc. So uh, lactate producers. Um, and are all of them required for a healthy gut? 
I would suspect yes. We believe so, yeah. But but I'll but I'll tell you how in a minute how the modeling can help us decide that because I think this is really interesting. So what we then we, so what we then did was we we you know we we set this up with uh, with math, mathematical specialists from BIOS in Edinburgh. Uh, Helen Kettle and Gretje Holtrup uh, from the Institute in, in Aberdeen. And they constructed a model, um, a computer model, mathematical model, um, that we applied to, to our um, chemostat, actually Alan Walker's chemostat experiment, where he'd done a pH to perturbation to the chemostat community and showed that this shifted metabolites and it shifted um, microbiota. In fact, this is what really started us thinking about this, because in his in his PhD work, he showed that it, at pH five point five, you you favoured butyrate production, but doing a switch to six point five, you greatly reduced butyrate production, greatly increased propionate production, and this corresponded to a shift in the dominant microbial groups present. Right. So the propionate producers were mainly bacteroides, and the butyrate producers were mainly these rosburia. Erectile organisms. So we we were asking, could we simulate that with our ten MFG ten functional group model? And the the simulation was remarkably successful. So a paper published in two thousand fifteen. Uh, Helen Kettle is is the first author on it. So um, that that was good for a while. And, yeah. But then we thought, wouldn't this be a whole lot more useful? If we could use use such modeling to interpret uh, fecal data, fecal sample data, and that's a paper we've just produced um, before Christmas um, in the Journal of Royal Society Interface. It's a new journal that specializes in things that are neither holy biology or neither uh, holy mathematics and do, physics. Do you find the ten functional groups in the stool samples across all healthy people based on the work you've done? Uh, well, yes, we do, but it's, 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 we discuss the methanogens. They may be high or low in different people, um, um, but it's almost by definition because, <laughs> uh, you know, we, we interpret the sequence data. We have to assign it to different functional groups, and with a lot of it, we have pretty good confidence, but uh, in other cases, it's a bit of guesswork because there just isn't enough information on what that sequence actually does. Got it. So, so it's it's a work in progress. It's it's evolving. But what I was going to say in answer to an earlier question was, um, one of the ways we can find out about the importance of each functional group, and it's very easy to do on the computer, is you just take it away. <laughs> <laughs> you, on, you take it away on in the computer, the, in the in model, the, the system. In the system, in the model system. And you say... But what? this model system is surely... I mean, is it representative? Yes. Uh, well, the, the, the proof of the pudding is, is in how well does it simulate actual data. And for, right. the, for the moment, it's doing pretty well, actually. I mean, it's not perfect. Wow. And we've picked up a couple of things, um, you know, like we had too much formate in our chemostat experiment, and that I then later on realized that we hadn't um, assumed that the cetogenic bacteria could use formate. And when we changed our assumptions, the formate disappears. In it. You know, so it, it's in, in the computer model. In the computer model. Wow. Yeah. So, so you that blows my mind in, in, get, in getting the computer model closer to reality, you're learning things about the system, and you can go back and do experiments. But the particular one that um, was of interest for us was what happens because we spoke about lactic acidosis earlier. So what happens if you don't have a group that uses lactate? Actually, we had two groups that use lactate. What happens if you take both of those groups away? You get acidosis. You get acidosis. And you don't, interestingly, you don't, because we, and we did this experimentally as well, um, it's much bigger problem at somewhat acidic pH than it is at neutral pH. And that's what we find experimentally. Wow. Mm -hmm. Can you do an FMT in this model? Ah. <sighs> Of course, that's where my mind jumps. But uh, if if you, if your transfer flora, well, actually, um, if 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 you know that in your recipient certain groups are already absent or reduced, you can ask what's the effect of replenishing those groups. Yes, that it it does have potential for for, for looking at that. And if yes. they're already, so let's just say, for example, if so, are there disease states that have all the functional groups? Do you think? Because that would kind of 
kick back your thesis a little bit, would it not? That they're essential, sort of, they're all essential for health, but they're all in someone with disease. How does that work? Okay, so I think it's entirely possible to be ill and have all the functional groups. Mm. We, we, know, we know that. But, they, but now, now we're on to diversity, and this is going to where I think this is going to get really fun. But can you have a disease and not have lower diversity than a control? Can you have a disease? Yeah, I'm sure that's. I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure that's the case. Yes. Because the most yes. reproducible finding. I mean, it depends. You, 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 I mean, disease is a very broad term, isn't it? You know? <laughs> but, we're, we're, so I'm getting onto the subject of diversity. I mean, you can have a heart condition and and and, and a perfectly normal microbiota, can't you? Well, I mean, I, can you? I, I don't. I, I wouldn't. I don't know if I'd be that definitive. What? What? Uh, where I'm okay. getting? This is what I'm getting at. Yeah, yeah. All right. So yeah. so. So my view, and, I, and I'm conscious I'm speaking to someone who's so much more experienced than me in this, and I'm a bit embarrassed even saying it, but my view is that the most reproducible finding across all the case control studies, all the interventional studies, is that lower diversity relative to a healthy control, and we can debate that, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or lower diversity relative to someone who was less sick, mm -hmm. same person, yep. is the, versus a higher diversity associated with less sickness either in the same person or control is the most reproducibly most sort of is the finding that is observed most frequently and it seems to be robust if i can call it that it yeah. happens again yeah. and again and again yeah. whereas the strain species genus level changes are more debatable because of functional redundancy or well i don't know why uh -huh, but uh -huh. but we yeah. so we don't we don't have a playbook or a book that says yeah. right okay you have ulcerative colitis okay we know for sure that you have absence of these functional groups or these strains or however we want to describe it, and you have too much of these we've got we've got ideas mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the classic one would be crohn's fecalibacterium parasitiae mm -hmm. wouldn't yeah. it yeah 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 but but what we do know is we could open the book and it would say, yeah, you almost certainly have lower diversity relative to when you didn't yeah, have yeah. active disease or a control. Yeah, yeah. So is diversity not king? I, I think it, it's hugely important. And I mean, I agree with you. I think the, it, to, to an extent, because the, the, certainly the, we mentioned MetaHit earlier. One of their papers had this wonderful bimodal curve where they'd looked at gene diversity across quite a large number of subjects. Um, and yes, there was a low diversity hump and a high diversity, and the low diversity people were somewhat more likely to have metabolic syndrome uh, and to be obese. Than, no, it wasn't a completely clear-cut thing. But but yes, there is, that, there is um, a consensus in adults in that direction. Whether... Whether it's true that extremely high diversities that you find in hunter-gatherers, for example, uh, in some studies, automatically make those p people healthier, I don't know. There are all sorts of debates you can have yeah. around that. So, so I, I would agree there's a diversity below which it, you're probably in trouble from a, from a health point of view. Whether more and more diversity is necessarily what you want, it's, it's I, don't, I don't know. And, and I, I mentioned this in our previous conversation is this my, my worry about this is is if you look at infants yep um there are i don't have an answer to this one yet yeah there, <laughs> <laughs> there are i'll number, be pondering it <laughs> there are a number of papers that would suggest that the breastfed infant has a less diverse microbiota mainly because it's dominated by bifida bacteria yeah. than the bottle fed infant um so which which is yeah, the struggling with that one which is bit. the healthier state so yeah. so i think it, it's not the be all and end all that's all i'm saying i think and maybe i'm placing too much emphasis yeah. on it but from, from my i've got a much more simplistic approach to this i think than you do because you have this insanely amazing understanding of the strains and how they change and what they produce and the system as mm. a whole whereas i take a maybe it's a more clinician approach <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Which is high diversity seems to be associated with health. Low diversity seems to be associated with disease. Okay. How do we get more high diversity in people? I think it's a good working hypothesis. Just a starting yeah, point. I, right? I, I don't have a problem with it from that point of view. And, um, you know, in terms of dietary manipulation, I think our work, a uh, little bit of work we did in vitro with the chemostat system where we looked at, you know, if, do you, is it better to supply five fibers or one fiber? Yep. You know, in terms of diversity, we actually looked at this. Um, the answer wasn't quite as clear cut as I expected, but uh, but what it did said is that if you if you only supply one fiber, then make it a complex fiber like wheat bran that has a lot of different linkages and you know will will create a lot of different niches. 
Yeah. You know, just chatting it through with you, I can think of two examples where high diversity is probably not a good thing. So Crohn's disease, seemingly, because we starve the microbes and you see a vastly reduced diversity after the EEN. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe there's a higher diversity of bugs that are causing the problem and that's the issue. Yeah. Maybe you need to change what's in there in these patients. I, I think the issue with, I mean, I, I, I'm not an expert and I'm not a medic either, so I shouldn't say too much, but um, there's a big genetic component, isn't there, in, in Crohn's disease. So so why are the, the Fecalic bacteria not there? Um, it's because something to do with the, the, the set of immune genes that those people have been dealt. You think they boot it out? They, like, kick it out? or Possible, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Well, some people uh, in, which, in which case trying to repopulate yep. is not going to be that. Successful. Well, it's going to be futile. Yeah, isn't exactly, it? Exactly right. Yeah. But some some people say that well, there there is a company that's developing Fecalibacterium as a single strain now, and they are doing a study. And I don't know if it's to maintain or induce remission. That's another key okay. question. Okay. Um. Uh, but maybe the FMT is more likely to be successful. I don't know. So we've we've gone on a huge. Very interesting discussion <laughs> away from your yeah. work. Yeah, yeah. But, but okay. I think we bring it back to your work, yeah. please, and how it evolved yeah. over the yeah. kind of latter parts of, of your career. Um, okay. Which is still going, of course, isn't it? Because you're still publishing. I'm still writing. You're still I'm, writing. I'm discussing and talking to people. Yeah. So, um, well, something that I wanted to come on to was the, was the, the uh, evolution of our butyrate work because having isolated these bacteria we started getting interested in the biochemistry we said well you know what pathway do they use for butyrate it turns out that and this is largely petra lewis's work the main uh final step in butyrate production in, in these organisms is is a coa transferase re re reaction butyryl coa acetate coa transferase and that's a well-known enzyme but yeah. it, 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 it most people before that would have assumed it was butyrate kinase, which is an alternative route that did the final step. Now, that's sort of, you know, a biochemist's interest, but it has implications. And one of the consequences we showed early on was that these organisms that use this enzyme are taking up acetate at the same time as producing butyrate. So some of the carbon comes from the, the, the polysaccharide, from the sugars, but additional carbon comes in from acetate. Now, why does that matter? Well, we discovered later on that the rate at which that happens is pH dependent. So in the pH 5.5, you get a lot more acetate taken up and a lot more butyrate produced than you do at pH 6.5, neutral pH. So jumping well ahead, <laughs> in 2022, <laughs> we published um, a, a retrospective analysis of 10 human studies that we'd done um, Okay. While, I, while I was still involved, and in which we'd looked, we'd looked at uh, microbiota changes in in human dietary trials in volunteers, um, and we'd also, in some cases, we had data on pH, uh, and we also had data on on the major metabolites, microbial fatty acids. So, um, oh, sorry, on the microbial metabolites piece, yeah, the fat, the short chain fatty acids are the most commonly described. There's others that are important, though. Oh, right? yeah, for sure. So yes. what could some of those be in terms of examples? Well, you've got uh, those, you've got um, nitrogenous products um, from fermentation of, of uh, um, uh, proteins and amino acids, um, some of which um, are thought to be bad guys, you know, amines, secondary amines and so forth, um, toxicity problems um, contributing to cancer. Um, you've also got... Um, and we did some work on this with Wendy Russell. You've also got phenolic compounds released by microbial action from fiber, ferulic acid, for example. These are good things? They are potentially good things because they have antioxidant pro yep. properties. And, um, but also they don't necessarily stay as ferulic acid. In this case, we showed that there's a transformation pathway. So you're getting additional bioactive compounds produced from this plant material by the bugs Right. It wouldn't be there without them. So, yes, there are lots of other metabolites. Okay. Yeah. Back to where you were. Sorry. Because yeah. <laughs> we, we always talk yeah. about the short-chain fatty acids. I mean, I guess yeah, no, it's bile acids yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bile acid transformation. Absolutely. Yeah, bile. yeah no, the, the, there's, yes, absolutely. Yeah. And there's some that we haven't characterized. There are right. plenty. There. Well, and there are secondary metabolites. But let me let me just okay, go yeah, back. Go, and okay. We can come back there. Yeah, but yeah, let me yeah, just yeah. finish that main <laughs> the main story. Okay, go for it. So, 
so th this this retrospective analysis that we did showed uh, a high level of, of statistical significance that the more sh the higher the concentration of short chain fatty acids in somebody's fecal sample, the higher the proportion of that that is butyrate. Okay, right, and that's been reported before. But except that we did it with, on 163 subjects, so we had a much, much uh, more convincing story. Um, at, at the same time, as the concentration, total concentration goes up, the concentration, the proportion, sorry, of um, branch chain fatty acids decreases. Now that makes sense because branch chain fatty acids only come from the fermentation of amino acids derived from protein. Yep. And so we assume. The people who have very high short-chain fatty acids in feces are, in, uh, are eating a lot of fiber or resistant starch and in relation to protein. So that, that explains that bit. But what explains the change in butyrate percentage? Because it doesn't apply to propionate. Right. Yeah. So I'm convinced, and this is what we say in the paper, that a big factor is this simple bit of biochemistry. Okay. Because... Why do people have high short-chain fatty acids in their feces? Because they're eating a lot of fiber. What happens when you eat a lot of fiber? There's a very active fermentation in the proximal colon. The pH drops. As the pH drops, you make more butyrate. Hmm. And there's another reason for that, which I'll, which I'll go on to. But, so I, that's the simplest explanation for the relationship that we saw. And of course, it's, it's not just esoteric because it has health consequences, sure. as we know. The butyrate it, it, for healthy people is an important protective molecule. Um, so the, the other mechanism, just to finish it off, is, is we, we've shown that um, butyrate-producing butyrate -producing bacteria compete more successfully with the bacteroides, which are propionate producers, at a lower pH, pH 5.5 compared to 6.5. And that was originally shown in, in Alan Walker's um, PhD work. And in the human gut, what are the determinants for pH? Is it diet predominantly? Well, that yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because it brings in the PPIs? point... PPIs? Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it brings in the point that... Um, uh, there is some host control, obviously, over the pH in the gut um, because we secrete yeah. compounds that can buffer the pH. So to some extent, the fact that the pH drops in the proximal column, because it's about 8 in the, in the terminal ileum, and then it drops by anything up to 3 units uh, as you move into the proximal column. You can show this by telemetry. We've, we've actually done it with a thing called the smart pill. So it gets more acidic going into the colon? Yes. I, I would have thought that after the stomach... It gets more acidic, does it not? Because that's the most the 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 stomach, as we know, is the, yeah the most acidic. But yeah. then in but then the small intestine is relatively um, alkaline. Well, it's a neutral. It tends oh. towards neutrality, and in fact, it gets it gets anything up, but certainly between seven and eight at the terminal island. Wow! And then it drops. And then it drops, and it's quite striking. You can track when well, you feed somebody this this smart pill, yeah, yeah. which we've only done a few times. Yeah. <laughs> it's rather large. Yeah. Um, you, you can track where it is by the fact by these pH changes. If you want a volunteer, I'd be up for that, by the way. Okay, yeah, well, speak to Alex yeah, Johnson. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> speak to Alex Johnson. I've had Johnson. my microbiome profiled yeah. extensively. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is. It's quite, and, the, and then yeah. over the rest of the colon, the pH goes gradually up, r recovers to, towards neutrality. So, wow. Um, yeah. Well, that explains... I think, based on what you've described, what's going on? I think it does. I, you know, we 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 wrote the paper up, and I reread the discussion a couple of days ago, and I still believe it. It's it's it's, it's still true. I, th I think it's <laughs> it's very persuasive, actually. Yeah. So before I well, I pulled you away a little bit to talk about the kind of uh, other other metabolites. Yeah, and I guess we're getting onto this dark matter piece, which was a very interesting part of your book. I've spoken about it on previous oh, yeah, podcasts. Yeah, yeah. You know what's there that needs yes. to be characterized that's not yet been characterized. So what, yes. are, what are your thoughts on that then as someone who's been involved in the characterization? Well, I think, I think, um, I think it's definitely true that some organisms are a lot more difficult to isolate than others. Um, and part of this is oxygen sensitivity. Part of it is vitamin requirements um, because, uh, and it's a very nice study done by Petra Lewis, uh, uh, on vitamin requirements in butyrate producers. It shows, for example, for Calibacterium, requires almost all the B vitamins. It can't make them. Really? Yeah. So it's one of the reasons it's very difficult to grow. Um, and that's, 
that was actually done experimentally, or but it, it it agrees with the pathways you predict from the, from the genome. Hmm. Okay, so is Fecalibatium the hardest, or might there be other ones that are even harder now? Well, there might well be. Yes. Yeah, I, we I, well, I mean, rumen ruminococcus bromii is a nightmare. So it to grow. Um, in a, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we you know we 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 thought we had a a rumen fluid free medium for it, um, uh, but then it started getting sick and we had to put a bit of room and fluid back because actually i didn't mention that the 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 work the isolation so how do you know the bug's getting sick well it, 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 so it doesn't tell you it, does it, it when no. you transfer it it grows doesn't, more more and more right. slowly okay and what it was right the, yeah that makes sense sorry no go please, yeah, no, please, no. please yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so when we did the rumen work uh rumen isolation work on the human that i talked about at the beginning yep. so we did isolated human gut bugs using room and fluid medium um I thought, well, this can't go on. We can't, A, we don't have access to the cows indefinitely to get rumen fluid, um, and B, um, you know, nobody's going to take this seriously if you can only ever grow it on yep. with rumen fluid. So, so I said, well, okay, what is, what is required? And actually, the simplest thing requirement was sh short-chain fatty acids. So I designed a You feed them the short-chain fatty acids? Well, we put it in the medium. So we... we but they produce the short-chain fatty acids. I know they do, but... So sorry. <laughs> so I took the rumen fluid out. This was with Adada Barcelona. I said, "Take the rumen fluid out. We'll put the short chain fatty acids huh. in. Don't put in butyrate because th those are the ones we're looking at. Yeah. But some of them might need. And indeed, Fecalibacterium requires acetate. Huh. It hardly grows without acetate. And you have to give it the acetate for it to get started. Wow. Uh, and some of the that's, other ones. That's really cool. So for the listener, then, just to contextualize that, what yeah. what you're basically saying is that products of microbial metabolism are required by other microbes by other microbes to grow exactly yeah. right this is this is a cross feeding uh, yep. theme that, wow. that, so 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 we discovered that and adela showed that um, some of them even require the branch chain fatty acids you know wow. don't you don't put those in, they can't grow at all wow. some coprococcus cocker, species are like that so um, anyway so we we published this medium called YCFA, we call it YCFA, which is simply room yep. and fluid medium with the room and fluid taken out and some, some acids added. Were you the creator of YCFA? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah the proper proper description um, of, of the medium is, 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 is in a paper in 2012, Lopez Siles et al. We published it much earlier in the original for Kaley Bacterium, but we made a mistake, which I'm oh. embarrassed about. Uh, but uh, so the proper... <laughs> So I, I'll tell you that my YFCA story, my YFCA story goes back five years ago and um, I was trying to get the company up and running and mm. well, my, a key thing mm. was uh, how do you determine how many likely viable anaerobic microorganisms mm. are in your FMT product? Right, right. That was a key question. Yeah. And we were using Columbia Blood Agar at mm. the time. Mm. So I did this kind of round table and Alan was on this round table. Yeah. Actually, Lou was on the round table. Asked someone else. And everyone came back and said, why are you not using YCFA? So there you go. That okay. was my first connection to you <laughs> five okay. years okay. ago. So dark matter. Dark matter. The dark matter, <laughs> the <laughs> microbiome. That sounds right. ominous. Yep, yep. So, yeah, so we get to the point where... Um, you know, growing bugs is not straightforward, and uh, you know the medium that you use is is, is critical, and uh, a lot of them have have a lot of requirements, vitamin requirements, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You even get to the extreme situation of things called syntrophs, which uh, what is that? Syntroph is a, is an organism that can really only grow in the presence of another organism. Wow. There are such things. Wow. So, and that's, so is that not a symbiosis? Not quite. I mean, it's a form. If you like, it is a form of symbiosis. But the, it it it's it's a term that's used for this particular problem of how do you how do you ever get this organism in pure culture? And the answer is you almost can't. But hold, hold on a second. So what what is it about the other organism? Is it something they produce? It's frequently it's an energetic thing. Is that the the, the reaction. Uh, the overall reaction can happen if the two organisms are present, but for thermodynamic grounds, it can't happen if only one of them is present. And there, there are papers on this from way back. No, my mind is blown. What, yeah. what, what does that even? What even is that? So, 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 is it, <laughs> do you think they're they're sensing each other? 
Mm, is it a form? Can I? I'm really. It's, you're it's, gonna laugh at this. Is it a form of consciousness? Uh, I, I wouldn't describe it like. <laughs> 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 it, it, it's 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 much it's much more prosaic than that. I'm afraid it's basic thermodynamics and uh, uh, you know necessity. It's, it's biochemistry is what it comes down to. Because there is this talk about quorum sensing there is indeed there is yes yeah well and uh, that's well well researched and well known i don't think it's as well known for human gut bugs as for or not as well researched anyways um you can find evidence of quorum sensing systems from the genomes um finding out what they do uh, how important they are is a different thing for the listener could you just give a very quick overview on quorum sensing well i'm not an expert in it let me say but it, I, it was originally discovered um in cultures of organisms where it became obvious that the density of the culture altered the gene expression the, the what what wow. and the behavior of the organism wow. so that that was the original discovery of quorum sensing and um what when it became really interesting because it, it involves signaling between cells and there are different type i won't because I probably can't remember them all. <laughs> remember, them. there are various different mechanisms. There's, there's, there's peptide mechanisms and yep. other, other, other types of cyclic uh, molecules that are involved in, in the signaling. But where it became really interesting was the discovery that, in fact, it didn't ne wasn't necessarily limited to a single species or a single strain, and that you could potentially get signaling between different groups of microbes. Which is fairly mind blowing. Yeah, it, it really is but, mind blowing. I love that. Yeah, I love it. But, <laughs> but I mean, it, it 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 has practical significance because I mean, it happens in some pathogenic organisms, and and right. it's a way it's a way in which the the organism decides when it's when it's a good idea, if I can put it like that, to to change its behavior. And you know, like when it when is a good point for us all to get to yep. start infecting. You know, if, yeah. there's, if there's only one of me, there's no point because I won't win. But, if, right. you know, if there's yeah. hundreds of me, then I will. You know? I get so, it. It's unbelievable. So that's a fascinating area, which, you know, has been of a lot of interest. But I don't I'm not aware, but I'm not up to date totally of, of, of a lot done on the anaerobes. Because where I was respect. going to and, and, yeah. and I'm and I'm I know I'm, I'm probably not right here and they're going to laugh again. But maybe they are talking to each other through some yet undiscovered mechanism. Well, it, you know, if you if you define signaling as talking, then yes, yeah. yes. But it's probably down to some metabolite they produce. Yeah. Anyways, back, well, back and, to the dark and, matter. And, and, are they, and the other thing is, are they talking to the host? Because that's that's really interesting. Well, that, as that well. I'm even more interested in that. You know, well, are, they, are they making us hungry? They're, they, well, they're, they may be helping us not be hungry. I mean, it, it, again, at a fairly mundane level, um, there's some evidence that propionic acid, for example, helps to uh, feelings of satiety. It helps to suppress. Uh, hunger Amazing. so but but there are there's also um some microbially produced um molecules that are thought to affect behavior yep. neurotransmission etc cetera, etc cetera. so yeah there, there's and even hormones so yep. yeah there are there are but I, i'm not an expert in any of those things so. <laughs> okay back to the the dark matter then so it's hard to culture some things because they've got specific requirements some even require the presence of another bug yeah, which is still blowing my mind a little bit, but I'm not sure there are any clear examples in the gut. I, I still, have to say, but it, it's certainly it's, well established it's, elsewhere. It's a thing. Yeah, so, yeah. so, so, what does that mean then for all the research that we've done to date? So, right. So, I think, I think, I mean, I'm fairly, I've been fairly positive about the product, uh, what you can gain from culturing, and one, one of the things we showed in one of our earlier papers was. If you looked at what proportion of the sequences out there are represented by cultured organisms. It's quite high for the more abundant organisms and it and it sort of tails off for the for the for right. the lo lower incidence ones. And that so that tells you partly that that uh, it's simply a problem of the intensity of culture and we haven't done enough. Right. You know, so maybe we get a lot more reward. I think there's a lot more reward to be gained from doing culture. more culturing. But there will still be things that are really difficult and, and underrepresented and a lot of them are in the Ruminococcaceae family that we've referred to, they seem to be particularly difficult. So um, one of the th one of the th ways of tackling it is a to say let's not bother culturing because we've got metagenomes and we can assemble um, uh, organisms genomes from this mass of data um, and. There's been remarkable success, even with the rumen in doing that. I mean, yes. I was very skeptical at one time, but it has it has it's been achieved. it has been achieved, and and even and then the next thing you can maybe do 
and this has again been achieved with the Roman, is you can say, look, here's a rather important looking um, uncultured organism, and maybe it correlates with uh, a diseased or health right. trait, and we need to know more about this. We'd quite like to culture it. Let's look at its genome and find out what its growth requirements should be from its genes. Mm -hmm. So it can't make all these vitamins, so we have to put those in. It can't do this, it can't do that. You know. So And there have been cases where... where um, cultivation of a, of a particular species has been helped by metagenome information. So that's that's one way forward, definitely. And I suppose now that the computers and the artificial intelligence is advancing, it might be able to tell you, based on everything that it knows in its database, yep. what's most likely to work for a strain that you've, yeah. That's yeah. true, that's true. With the slight caveat, and <laughs> I'm afraid I'm always a skeptic on almost everything, but it is that is that the annotation is not perfect. So right. you will get genes that are con the computer confidently tells you do such and such, and there's actually no evidence that they do that. They may be distantly related to right. something that does such and such, but as particularly you know detailed work we've done on enzymes suggests that you can't assume just because something's in the amylase family that it's an amylase. It's, you know it's a, it's a sort of degree of certainty that so with that caveat with, but what that says to me is that um, you need not just to do bioinformatics you also need some real science going Makes sense. if i could say that to, yeah yeah <laughs> to go along <laughs> and, to, and to keep informing the the bioinformatics mm -hmm. process because you need better annotation better understanding of, mm -hmm. of, 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 of function basically we've spoken a lot about bacteria mm. but there's also the viruses yep it's also the fungi Yep. The protozoa. Yep. Uh, how important are these aspects? For, for the human? Yes. Um, well, hugely important, obviously. Um, so the, the, the virome, um, which is the total collection of uh, viruses in there, um, in the gut is presumably dominated, well, we know it's dominated by uh, viruses that infect bacteria. Yep. Um, uh, but we know remarkably little about them. Um, there is some evidence that in disease states like ulcerative colitis and so forth and Crohn's disease that the, the virum changes. What does this mean? Is this just a reflection of the bacterial hosts changing or does it implicate the viruses in some, you know, causation or unknown quantities? So that that's a huge topic, that a very complicated topic that needs developing and looking at. I mean, we know viruses, we had some work on this ages ago, um, can carry uh, pathogenicity determinants. So the um, E. coli 157, mm -hmm. sugar toxin, gets uh, transferred between strains on, on a virus. And, uh, really? Yeah, bacteriophage. So that's, well. that's, um, and that's one of the reasons you get such a diversity of, of uh, uh, positive strains in the rumen, is that that process is happening all the time. Wow. So no, virus is massively important, and, and not just as as direct agents of human uh, disease. And what, why is it that we know relatively so little in comparison to the bacterial aspect? Is it the fact that it's harder to study? They're not metabolically active, so they're not as important. All or? those, all those things, all <laughs> those things. I mean, if you think about it, getting viral sequences is not so difficult. It's it's uh, interpreting them functionally because unless you have um you know a host system that you can infect uh, and study the virus's behavior it's very difficult i mean having said that i mean some of the the molecular biology grew largely from the investigation of e coli viruses right so lambda bacteriophage um t4 phage you know the these were the, the what led to molecular biology and and without those we wouldn't have Hmm. recombinant DNA technology wouldn't have restriction on mm -hmm. any of these things you know it's, yeah. what about the fungi then okay so again it's, I mean I used to work on fungi but I've never <laughs> I haven't worked on gut fungi particularly but um, yeah no I mean uh, the fungi um, are commensal fungi the ones that don't cause disease are probably under, under seriously understudied we don't yeah. really know a lot about them I mean the disease causing ones like candida there is a definite there was an important research effort here in Aberdeen, which has largely shifted south. But to exter, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And again, it's understudied because it's harder to study or... They have bigger genomes. They're not so easy. You know, they, there's not been the effort put into finding out how to grow them in pure culture. 
Um, so to fully understand what a healthy microbiome is, which is a topic for discussion, we probably need to do some more work on the virus and the, the fungi. Yeah, and uh, and the protozoa, and and uh, mo- with these eukaryotic organisms, the protozoa, the fungi, the interaction of the immune system, I think, is key. Is key. Yeah, yeah. Because some we could build a healthy microbiome together, mm-hmm. conceptually, mm-hmm. and we could have a debate about whether there should be a helminth in your microbiome or not, couldn't we? We, we could. I mean, we, could ha- we could have the debate. We, we, we could have the debate. Well, well yeah. let's build a healthy microbiome then. So if you, eat, eat worms, if you were, if yeah. aliens came down yeah, and they yeah. sort of, uh, mm. they, they said, right, mm. Professor Flint, mm. you need to tell us. <laughs> <laughs> tell us what a healthy microbiome should look like because we're going to build one artificially and we're going to give it to everyone on the planet and everyone's going to be better. What would you, what would you do? Okay, so my, my first, I mean, the sim- simplistic thing is to say, well, make sure you haven't got any bad guys in there. Make sure there are no pathogens, uh, and as far as possible, no pathogenicity, gene islands, and this type of thing. So, and that that is the first thing thing that you'd want to ensure. Um, preferably, don't have don't don't have it stuffed full of antibiotic resistance genes. Is that possible these days? Uh, I I doubt whether it is possible, regrettably, because um, you know, I mean. You, you you could in principle uh, give somebody a very effective enema and clear out their microbiome and replace it by a set of strains that were all. Oh, is this the coffee enema? No, we're well, talking about <laughs> we're talking about something else. <laughs> These colonic irrigations, yeah. Well, that sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, <laughs> I'm pleased to say I have no personal experience with this. So. Yeah, likewise. Um, yeah. Right. So no, I mean that's what would you have to do? Because I mean. We've all got antibiotic resistance bacteria in, in our guts, haven't we? I, to some degree. Um, and I mean, from work we've done in the past, we know that somebody who's on lifelong antibiotics, um, you, they, you can look at them their, their um, profile and they look perfectly normal in terms of species strain distribution. But all of those bugs are now antibiotic resistance for the, whatever they've been eating, consuming. Whoa. Yeah. No, we, that, that was very clear cut conclusion i did not know that yeah yeah in fact they and they didn't just have one resistance gene per cell they had several (laughs) for that one antibiotic so it's 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 scary it's very difficult so you 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 only need a tiny number to remain in the microbiota and 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 the resistance will just spread all over the place so yeah so no baddies ideally no oh i do yeah ideally no resistance um so, and, and then I think we would want our functional groups, but they need to be better defined and expanded. But we would, I think, you would want all the functional groups represented that 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 we've we've established are are, are important for, for for balance of the community and for health of the host. Um, keystone species we've mentioned should be present, um, and. You'd like me to say this, and I'm happy to say it. We want we want it to be diverse, <laughs> because with diversity comes resilience. Um, yeah, no, it does. Yeah, it's yeah, true. Yeah, 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 resilience yeah. to challenge, perturbation. Um, so, I, all of those things. Um, how you achieve it is 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 not is not. Uh, well, you've got two tools, haven't you? I mean, you've got you the ability to reimplant individual strains, groups of strains, yep. whole. Um, uh, or, uh, sets of organisms. Um, I think we, we we should be looking more, uh, uh, and we have been actually with some externally funded work in the past, uh, looking more at trying to develop anaerobes uh, as as organisms that we can reimplant yeah. in cases where they're clearly absent or, or you know there's a niche available for them. Yeah, and um, so. Next generation probiotics, if I can call them that, I think are a real prospect. At one time, people would say, well, no, they're anaerobes, you can't do that, they won't survive the stomach, but actually they do, or you can protect them. There are all sorts of ways of doing it. The other thing that's uh, really very practical is um, prebiosis. So uh, make a dietary supplement uh, that's a particular fiber or compound that will promote uh, a, a, a bacterium that, that, or group of bacteria that you want to to uh, to benefit health. 
Um, it doesn't have to be a fiber. It could be a vitamin. Because we're right. talking about this vitamin. Or it could be another bacteria. That or it, <laughs> well, or it could be, uh, yes, indeed, it could be another bacteria. Yes, because yes. the definition of prebiotic doesn't extend to another bacteria, does it? At the moment, it doesn't. But maybe no. it should. It maybe it may may need to be widened. Yeah, Shoot, that, can we write a paper? <laughs> <laughs> it probably probably be quite a successful paper actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So bit, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. we've got a couple minutes left. Yeah. Um, should we just touch on what your perspectives are for the future, if we can cover that in a couple of minutes? If not, well, I, I, we'll we, get you back on to Inside Matters and we'll talk about the future. <laughs> I'm a future kind of guy. Yeah. yeah. No, no, I mean, I, I, I can do a brief rundown because we've touched yeah. on quite a lot of this already. Yes. Um, so I do, I, do think, I do think theoretical modeling will become more important in link. It, it's one thing to have massive amounts of sequence data, which is guaranteed. We can all get our individual microbiota profiles done uh, from, through companies or however we want. Um, but it's interpreting that mass of data that, that becomes crucial. So I think I think the theoretical modeling angle will become more important in relating what is a single snapshot still profile mm -hmm. to transit, to what we eat, to uh, how we would manipulate and change our, our microbiome. So so that's that's one area I think I think will be important uh, in research terms. But as we've touched, touched on in terms of interventions, then um, uh, yes, you've got targeted prebiotics, you've got next generation probiotics, and you've got other methods of, of, of improving the microbiome. Um, but then another thing that I think is, which we did touch on earlier, is really important is, is um, individual differences yes. and stratifying people, Prevotellobacteroides, clearly those two groups of people respond differently to dietary change um, there are also health differences that are not completely right. nailed down but you can't treat everybody as the same um, likewise anybody with a, with a gut disorder yep. you know, need, need special thought and consideration as to so having having blanket solutions for the whole population I don't think is going to work I think uh, you can have recommendations for the average person but I think Increasingly, we'll need to tailor make our recommendations. So the future is personalised. I think so too. Yeah. yeah. Good. Harry, it's been a privilege and a pleasure. Thank you. I've enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Cheers. <laughs>